Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name's Simon Howard from UXIF, and it falls to me to do the first thank you of the evening. National Ethical Investment Week is a campaign UXIF has run now for a, in our sixth year, and we're very grateful to just share for putting one of their regular series of talks under the NEIW banner this evening. The topic tonight couldn't fit better with National Ethical Investment Week, principles and profits, investing to protect people, the planet, and your savings, exactly the territory which we want to see aired this week. As many of you will know, Just Share is a coalition of churches and charities committed to global development and social justice, and they run regular lectures and seminars of this kind uh, for the audience in the City of London and beyond. When we break for refreshments, fair trade refreshments, which we'll do at the end of the session, there will be leaflets on the refreshment tables, and please do pick them up uh, or sign up for, for the mailing list. I must also thank the rector for making this splendid venue available. I have never spoken in anything quite like this. Isn't it interesting? I mean, the echo sounds really good from where I'm standing. The ancestors knew how to build, didn't they, to, to, you know, to get the acoustics right. Anyway, to the subject matter. We've got two speakers this evening, uh, distinguished in our field. I look forward to hearing from them. The first uh, on the left, as you look, is Victoria Heath. Victoria is head of sales at ERIS, and ERIS uh, is a research organization founded by churches and charities, which looks into the, uh, investigates the ethics of the corporate sector, produces a lot of data and insight into how they're behaving. Victoria has been with ERIS since 2003, and she's head of sales there and she has responsibility for the major account relationships. So she's dealing regularly with some of the largest fund managers in the country and in the world. Her historical focus at ERIS has been on charities, charity fund managers, religious organizations, and wealth managers. Uh, outside ERIS, Victoria is a board member of the ECCR and is on the editorial board of Wealth Briefing. Our second speaker on the right as you look is Louise Rouse from what is now called Share Action, following a very successful rebranding. I think that went very well. Previously, Fair Pensions. Louise has been Director of Engagement at Share Action since 2009. She leads on engagement with investors and listed companies for the organization's environmental, social, and governance engagement projects. Prior to Share Action, Louise was a lawyer, sat for two years on the Council of the Law Society of Ireland, and was a member of the Association of European Bar Associations Committee on Corporate Social Responsibility. So those are our two speakers this evening. When they've spoken, we'll have questions and answers, and then, as I say, we'll break for refreshments. So I'll hand over, first of all, to Victoria. Can you hear me now? Brilliant. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the introduction. So, tonight we're looking at the challenges presented to institutional investors, what sustainability means to investing and how to enable individuals to take control of their pensions and savings by encouraging an interest in the ethical activities of major corporations. Um, the pension bits is very much Louise, so I'm going to steer clear of that because she's better at that than me. But, that was loud. Um, just a few questions to ask yourself. Um, do you know where your money's invested? What are your views with regards to the economy, human rights, and the environment? I think many people feel that they're not shareholders and they forget that the bank that they bank with, um, the pension plan that they hold, and the decisions that they make in terms of where they shop and what they buy on a daily basis has a very clear bearing on um, supporting corporates and the behavior therein. Unfortunately, the way of the world is that it's money that speaks. 
So fund managers have a big part to play in it. Um, as my introduction said, I do deal with a, an awful lot of um, fund managers. And I think it's fair to say, and I've got some statistics from a few press releases later on, that fund managers are looking more and more into implementing ethical investment, socially responsible investment, ESG in their investment, and um, sustainability. It's probably a good place to explain what I think the difference is between these terminologies. Um, when I first started at um, IRIS, it was mainly ethical investment that people were talking about. It grew into socially responsible investment as the terminology. ES and G simply refers to the environmental, social and governance pillars of responsible investment. Nowadays, sustain sustainability seems to be a more popular terminology, especially with fund managers, because the way that they work, they're looking for financial sustainability. So it's logical that you can link in environmental, social and governance sustainability into their normal mindset of um, financial sustainability. And there are a lot of studies that would demonstrate that actually the incorporation of sensible sustainability measures in the investment process and knitting that in with their financial uh, magic or otherwise that they work on the investments um, can dem demonst demonstrably lead to a much better return in the medium to long term. We um, released some figures this week, I think, because it's National Ethical Investment Week. Uh, we've recently found out that um, green and ethical retail funds and money invested therein is at an all-time high of 12.2 billion pounds. The first figures that we have on this were gathered in 2001, where the figure was 4 billion pounds under management. We think that the, the, the 12.2 billion is, billion is spread across 80 funds. We also estimate um, that a large body of the growth has taken place between June 2012 and June 2013, where 10 of the funds grew by over 50 percent, 23 of them grew by 20 to 50 percent, and 18 grew by over 10 percent. So perhaps despite the current financial backdrop, the interest in green and ethical funds remains strong, and the area is growing. In terms of what you can do, you can vote with your feet. There have been um, many corporate scandals recently, which I'm happy to go into on, on Q&A, which would involve your behavior as a consumer. I'm sure that you all know some of the brands that I'm talking about. Um, I think the only positive side of some of the awful things that have happened recently is that these things are newsworthy. People know about them, they read about them, and they do have more of an effect um, on a brand and a company's reputation than they used to have. Um, another example of that would be a um, major oil spill that there was in 1989 had um, much less of an effect on the company's share price than the recent BP oil spill had on their share price. So it seems to be that these things are more in the public consciousness. Another survey that we've recently gathered response from, that would be this week as well, was in conjunction with Ipsos Mori, where we found that in a poll we surveyed 2,015 adults. These figures are astonishing, really. 65 of them felt, 65% rather, of them felt it was essential or very important that a pension fund scheme invests in companies that act in line with conventions and principles that prevent child labor. 65% of them felt the same on preventing forced labor and 55% of the people felt that they would like to invest in institutions that respected workers' rights, 54% on protecting human rights, and 46 on safeguarding the environment. That's interesting to me because historically it's been the environment that's potentially been at the forefront of people's minds and consciousness in terms of areas of concern. And to see the resurgence of human rights and social issues is an interesting statistic for me. There are more statistics to do with that, but I'm only supposed to be 10 minutes. I've got so much to say. I, I'm not sure if I shouldn't wrap up, really. Have I been nearly 10 minutes, or shall I carry on? A little longer. Um, so talking about, I think, some of um, 
the, the, the corporate scandals that have happened recently, people are more and more aware of these things and they tend to be taking them into their, into their consciousness. I'm sure you're all aware of the, um, the Rana Plaza incident recently um, and maybe you watched the BBC expose their programs on that. Um, I think the underlying facts of interest that perhaps you might not know is that um, Bangladesh is the second country to China now for ready-made clothes, the ready-made clothes sector. The difference between China and Bangladesh is that the average salary of a worker in that sector is one-fifth of what it is in China. So logically, one can only see that that might actually be very attractive to people who are very interested in the bottom line. The other conclusions from that um, terrible incident, and there have been further incidents since that in that area of the world, are that the brands that uh, are potentially implicated in that are actually trying to make a big noise about being seen to do something to redress the balance, which is great to see. But this is newsworthy too. So I think this in itself demonstrates progress in terms of brands actually recognizing that it might impact on their company value and share price. Um, the fact that they've, that they've been um, implicated in this kind of thing. There are various other corporate scandals that I could go into, but I think talking a bit more about sustainability, companies are now much more likely to be producing um, a sustainability report. It's not just an annual report. The companies that we research anyway are much more likely to be looking at the kinds of variables that we would want to know about on behalf of our clients, of asset owners and asset managers. Um, I think that performance um, on the whole in some sectors is improving. The, uh, the sustainability element of it is bringing it more into the public consciousness. There is more factoring in of ES and G into investments. I think, how could it not be a good idea, really? So that's where we we are with that. Um, I think performance, the old, the, old, um, the old adage that actually you're going to perform worse as a company if you take um, corporate social responsibility into account in terms of ESG and sustainability and ethics is being challenged more and more strongly. There are a number of um, studies out, academic and otherwise, that disprove that point. And I think I would say that, that there's no evidence that that's the case. However, if I was being less optimistic, I'd say that there's evidence on both sides now. So financial performance is becoming less of an issue because there's more evidence that that's no longer the main problem. There is more and more of an interest nowadays in socially responsible investment and there's staggering growth as well. And the issues that happen in terms of corporate scandal are now a lot more newsworthy. I think that happened with the BP oil spill, really. I think that the um, newsworthiness of that was such that people are picking up on all kinds of things post that, not least of all the issues that um, Vedanta is linked to. I think most people are aware of those now. Um, obviously, BP and also the banking sector and uh, potentially Barclays and and the LIBOR rigging scandal. And I, when I started doing this about 10 years ago, I don't think the general public really had much of a handle on the things that were happening. And now you can talk to almost anybody and, and they know what's going on. So I think that is a really good sign. Um, that's really where I'm at with, with my introduction, but I would be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria cautious optimism, perhaps, in some of the things you mention. Let's see if Louise shares that. So, uh, Louise, if you'd like to speak. Okay. Um, can people hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, thanks to Just Share for organizing tonight, um, and thanks to the rector of um, what is really a splendid venue, and I, um, I feel both proud and humbled, if that's possible. Um, um, I'm also conscious that um, faith and finance are sometimes uneasy bedfellows. Um, and as a banking lawyer, I'm waiting to be ru um, sent running from the temple, um, which is you know, one of the few biblical references to dealing in money while standing in a church. Um, and principles and profits, likewise, people might feel it's one or the other, and it's very hard. Um, and that's all wrapped up, too, in we have to live in the world we're living in and sort of be pragmatic and do what we can 
um, rather than isolating ourselves um, in a way that, you know, can't function, can't, can't have an income, we can't invest in anything. And I guess um, the other Christian sort of metaphor um, I think of is that, you know, let he who, uh, um, who is without sin cast the first stone. And so I don't like to categorize people or companies into saints and sinners, but rather we are all capable of being more perfect um, as Jesus would have, would have wanted us to be. Um, and I think for us as an organization, we're very much of the view, if individuals have money invested, um, what can they do to make that more perfect, an investment? Not just in terms of the financial return, but in terms of the moral and principled return uh, that that investment can bring for them. Um, and for some people, that will mean they do not want to invest in certain things. They don't want to invest in alcohol manufacturers or arms companies or oil and gas companies. And we believe that if people want to express that preference uh, through their investment decisions, they should be able to do so. Those products should be available to allow them to express their ethical preferences. And that they should be, first of all, told where their money is invested. So most people with a pension have no idea where that money is invested. They're not legally entitled to find out where it is invested. They are legally entitled to be told it's invested in equities or it's invested in the London Stock Exchange or the Global Stock Exchange or in something called alternatives or private equity. But they're not entitled to be told we have this many shares in this company or we own this property. Um, and we think individuals have to make known uh, to their providers, we want to know where every pound of my pension is actually going. We have a number of people who ring our office and say, you know, I've just found out I'm invested in an arms company. Um, I'm actually a member of, you know, campaign against the arms trade. <laughs> I donate money every month to fight the arms trade, and it turns out that, that I'm invested in it. This is crazy. How did this happen? Um, and so there's just a complete lack of awareness of where our money is. We don't even get a chance to live our principles out because we've no idea they're being compromised. Maybe that, maybe that suits some people, but I think most people would like to know um, first and foremost. Um, and what we focus on is helping people and empowering individuals to actually look at what is a very complex financial system, um, something that seems completely beyond their comprehension, and breaking it down so they can take actions to put their principles into action. So I'm going to just talk through a couple of examples of things we've done, because I think that's, that's the best way to bring it to life. So obviously we're living in the age of austerity. Previous generations got to live in the age of enlightenment. Um, we're left with the age of austerity. Um, and we are living in a country where I saw an ad for Save the Children UK, where they were asking for donations to help children in the UK. Which is just, I mean, when I was a child, the ads were to help children in Africa. There are now ads on British television to help buy food for British children, which, you know, is disturbing. We have food banks in the city. Um, and we have a huge number of people who work and who contribute, but who receive welfare because they receive such low wages. And at the same time, we have chief executives of major companies who earn seven-figure salaries um, you know, and you know, work for that, uh, but they you know, employ people in their businesses who maybe are visiting food banks at the weekend. Um, and there is a campaign, a long-standing campaign, that started in the East End of London um, to encourage companies to pay a living wage to all of their staff. So this is above the minimum wage, and it's a figure that is calculated using simple things like what, what does an average grocery basket that would include nutritious food, what would that cost? What would a clean, damp-free house cost to rent? And so on. So it's a cost of living um, wage that's calculated. Um, and only two, two and a half years ago, only two of the 100 largest companies in the UK were doing anything about the living wage. Only two. Um, and now there are 13 doing something about it. And that is due to supporters of our organization, Share Action, um, working together to actually challenge those big companies and say, you know, we're invested in you. My pension is invested in you. And I think you should be paying your staff enough money for them to live on. And, you know, they shouldn't be in poverty. In-work poverty should not exist in a developed nation. It's insane. It shouldn't exist in a company where people are earning seven-figure salaries. Um, so we've had individuals um, contacting these companies um, and saying, we want you to pay living wages. We've helped individuals go to the annual general meetings of these companies 
um, which you're entitled to do, um, and ask questions. And that pressure from individual savers has resulted in an additional 11 companies taking action on the living wage. Um, HSBC was one of those companies. When HSBC made their decision to apply a living wage as opposed to a minimum wage nationally, it raised the income of 3,000 people overnight. 3,000 people overnight saw an uptake in their wages. They moved from minimum wage employment to receiving enough um, to live um, and to not have to work second jobs to, to afford basic means. So there is really, the living wage campaign that we run is evidence of the fact that individuals who might feel there's very little they can do do have power. You own these companies through your savings. When you put your savings away every month, it is used by um, fund managers to buy shares in companies. They own them. You own them. When the financial crisis happened, everyone's, I'll rephrase, when the financial crisis started, it's still happening, um, everyone said, we now own the banks. We now own RBS and we now own Lloyds. We've always owned them. We've always owned them. Um, and it's just that we've never known we've owned them and we've never exercised it. So it's very, very important that people realize, you know, we are citizens, we are, you know, taxpayers or we're taxpayers, um, we are pension savers, and we are capitalists, unwittingly. We own these giant institutions. Um, and that's the greatest secret. That's what they don't tell us. They like to keep it separate. But actually, if we recognized as a people, we have control over these companies through our savings, through our pensions. And I want to express my principles in a way that will change the behavior of those companies. You have the power. Um, and and or, uh, our organization exists specifically to help individuals um, take action um, on issues. We're helping a group of people right now who don't want their particular pension fund to have tobacco. And we're helping them engage in a dialogue around that. Um, we're just about to launch a major campaign which will focus on climate change. What are the pension funds of Britain, with your money, um, doing to tackle climate change? Um, the biggest pension funds in the country have um, occupational pension schemes have about 800 billion worth of assets under management. And that money currently is stuck in high carbon, old fashioned, business as usual industries, um, rather than flowing towards what it needs to flow to, to ensure that we don't have catastrophic climate change, that people in the poorest parts of the world don't continue to experience impacts of climate change. We're, we're waiting for the flood, you know, the flood's going to come in decades to come here. It's happening in, in the poorest parts of the world already, they're experiencing it. Um, so, um, I would just like to leave you guys all with the message that if you have any sort of pension savings, any product like an ISA, you are hugely powerful. Hugely powerful alone and together, even more powerful. And it's very, very important that you begin to ask questions of the people who take your money each month and just go and invest it business as usual. Um, and it's important, I guess a lot of people who are, you know, members of Just Share or in this building are probably people of faith. And I think it's important to see your savings and your investment as a forum for the expression of your faith, but in a pragmatic, practical way, one that doesn't require you to, you know, remove all your possessions, cast them aside, and follow a particular path. You will get through that needle, um, I think, um, but it's very important uh, that you don't think it's too big and it's too complicated. It's all yours, and you own it. And it can be as simple as we make it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Louise. Right. Time for questions. Fascinating speeches. One as I sum up, my perception is that the city, the fund managers, I'm an ex-fund manager, are beginning to move, so the cautious optimism, which I alluded to in Victoria's. Louise focusing instead on how much more there is to do, but with signs of progress, 11 companies doing the living wage in the last two years. So two different aspects, glass half full, glass half empty. Who'd like to do the first question? The gentleman at the back. Thank you, Moin Yassin 
from Global Vision 2000. Firstly, I appreciate the contributions from the floor. However, I think we need to ask fundamental questions as the clock is ticking. We've got the shutdown debate in America. When we talk about ethics, etc., social justice, and since we're in a temple, and uh, I'm coming from the Abrahamic tradition, is one of the key fundamental values. I appreciate the values you've been championing. There's no clash. However, at a time of disintegration of the debt-based usurious banking system, let me be very clear, compound interest, I mean any type of interest, why are we not challenging this monster, the elephant in the room, which is drowning governments, students, companies, com everyone. So I'd like your comment on this, the monster that is devouring the world. Why isn't that part of the ethical movement? Thank you. I think fundamentally the entire capitalist system, certainly the debt basis of it, why, why don't we in the ethical sphere, socially responsible fear, actually go for that fundamental? Why do we work with the existing system rather than perhaps demanding an alternative? Quite a big question. Um, okay, well, it's a valid question. Um, and I would say that there are some people who, in organizations, who are actually working to raise some of those big questions. I mean, the Occupy movement, which was only up the road, was very much examining whether the system as it exists should continue, whether we should think about new systems. Um, there are think tanks like the New Economics Foundation who are doing research into alternatives, for example, to GDP as a measurement of um, you know, national success. So I think you know, there are organizations who do it. Why, why don't we do it, which is another valid question is that, you know, first of all, I guess the remit of our organization as a charity is, is responsible investment, so that's what we focus on. But I think, you know, if I was to put a theoretical answer around that is we very much look at there is the world as it is and there is the world as we would like it to be. Um, and we try and improve to the extent possible the world as it is as an incremental movement towards the world as it should be. Um, we don't think the work we do is mutually exclusive from work that asks the bigger questions. But we think that while those bigger questions are being asked, it's really, really important to try to improve the world as it is right now. And so for some people, you know, we fight those more maybe conservative incremental battles. But we think um, it's very important that they are fought while waiting for the game to change fundamentally. I don't think I could say it better than, than, than Louise did. I mean, it, I agree with what she said about the, the other organizations that are trying to make um, progress in the bigger picture. I mean, our remit, again, is to improve, well, to, uh, to report on corporate performance, to allow um, uh, asset owners and managers to, uh, to, to, to implement um, these measures in, in their investments, and hopefully that goes some small way to um, improving corporate behavior. We do look at various measures of corporate governance, which could be loosely related to, to the gentleman's question, but we are very much working with the system as it is and trying to improve it as well. Um, this, this is a follow-on on the same sort of topic, really. I think uh, the gentleman behind me was talking about uh, national debt as, as a big elephant in the room. Um, another one we had in an earlier talk was growth, and so we're talking about macroeconomics here, really. Um, I can talk a little bit about microeconomics. So if you have um, an investor um, and he can get a certain amount of interest and he's also got to deal with the inflation rate, then the last time when that investor was paid, say by the building society account or the bank ISA, cash ISA or something like that, less than the inflation rate. In other words, he's paying the bank to give them his money. Um, was under uh, Kennedy 
in 61, 62, when they had the space race against Russia, the first man on the moon. And people willingly went ahead with that. The whole population of America, virtually. Um, and again, people are either blind or going ahead with it today. Um, and so, um, and I've just been to a tiles exhibition at Wandsworth Museum, which had three people cowering underneath the angel of righteousness who was there all around them. One was hiding their ears, another one was hiding their sight, the other one, you know, just crouching down, probably hiding their mouth, not saying anything. Um, in other words, it's fear. So that is another monster. You've got three monsters, um, national debt, um, fear, growth. Um, and it's all tied up with economic theory. I mean, sometimes it's a good idea to go into debt to be able to finance something. Um, and you get better, you know, you, you take a loan out, which you can afford, so you're not going to debt, but you take a loan out to finance things. I mean, that's a basic principle of capitalism. So I want to know where you think it all ties up, please. <laughs> currently who has to engage in the system and take on debt. So we are in extraordinary times, I think, is the question. Um, is, it, is it fair, is it reasonable to expect individuals to cope uh, in, in the current climate, or, or are we driven to the need to do something more radical? Um. <coughs> oh, okay, so, um, all right. Um, I would say, I'm a fan of President John F. Kennedy, um, but I would say that um, we have to rescue ourselves. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not meaning this uh, in a faith way, but I, I don't think we should be waiting for, you know, a, a, a savior to, to come along and rescue us. I think that the thrust of our organization is, in fact, we, we were told in those generations, you know, you are the little people, and the system will determine what happens. And the people who are at the top of that system, be they politicians or the leaders of the finance system, will set the rules. And then you follow. And you take whatever fallout occurs from that. And that's been the message since the financial crisis as well, by the way, which is, you know, um, you know leave it to us. You just give us the money. We'll bail out the banks. But don't get involved. Um, now, what we do as a whole organization is say, we need to pull the, the wool from people's eyes. Um, the system is us, okay? So the city used to be, pre-financial crisis, um, quite comfortable with this idea of, you know, you, you're nothing to do with us. We are a unique entity. Um, and all we knew of the city was, you know, well-tailored suits and champagne breakfasts, okay? And the crash in the 80s after the storm on the Wednesday, right? So that, that's all we knew about the city. And then the system collapsed. And all of a sudden, the city came rushing out to us and said, but don't you realize, you, you know, we're all part of the same thing and you need us, you know, bail us out. Um, and I think, you know, I always said the one bright spot in the financial crisis was that it brought the city into people's living rooms. You know, the city suddenly became a nurse in her job. In Ireland, where I'm from, it became having to pay extra money on your insurance policy because an insurance baron didn't have enough money to pay out insurance policies. It became very, very real, the city, for people. Um, but we've kind of receded from that, and we've gone back to sort of, you know, lobbying it back to the politicians. The money that flows around the city of London is yours. The 800 billion that is held by occupational pension funds and, and used to buy up government bonds all over the world is your money. But we don't, we don't, we, you know, we don't occupy that money metaphorically. You know, so we occupied the stock exchange. Again, we saw it as a third party. It's something to occupy. It's people to protest against, as opposed to let us power. There's actually a very obvious, easy route of revolution here of the finance system. We only have to recognize we have the power and cut through the complexity and the jargon and the acronyms that the city like to throw at you to tell you you don't understand. I think anybody can understand that's my money. 
and I want to know what you're doing with it. Justify why you're doing what you're doing. So that would be what I would say to ordinary people. Don't wait, act. The idea that the financial crisis brought the city into the living rooms, the corporate scandals also did that to an extent, Victoria. Uh, are you able to generalize on the scandals? Are there any themes you think ran through all of them which we should be alert to and aware of? I, th I think the best theme for me is the fact that the public know about them. They're more likely to get invested, for want of a better word, in the corporate scandals and to find out about them. And I think that the uh, financial situation that we're in, as well as bringing the finance sector into our living rooms, has made people realize that actually these corporate scandals are probably one of the reasons why these things have happened anyway, especially in the banking sector. And as a citizen that is involved, because we all are all being asked to make um, various measures to, to contribute towards everything being okay again, um, people are getting more personally involved in the things that happen and understanding the, the, the ramifications therein. It's great to me that these things do make headlines and it's great to me that you can speak to almost anybody on the street and they know about it. I really don't think it was the case more than 10 years ago. It was probably just people like me and Louise and, and religious investors that probably knew about what was really going on in corporates. And I think more than that, because it's been demonstrated time and time again that there is an effect on share price from bad corporate behavior from many different angles, be it something like, um, as I mentioned, the Barclays libel scandal and present conjecture that they um, borrowed money from the Qataris to avoid um, uh, any further action on, on the money that they needed, um, or be it uh, the Rana Plaza, which is the latest one, the effect on the share price of uh, the BP oil spill. Everybody knows about that now, and they didn't know that before. And I do think that it directly links back to company performance and brand value, and people are beginning to make the link. Actually, you need to have really good health and safety policies implemented within your organization if it's a hazardous business, or otherwise bad things will happen. So I think that's all good progress. One, one possible gain. Of, of what's happened, yeah. Okay, perhaps move on to the next question. Uh, John, I think you were just the first. Uh, John Arnold from ECCR, the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility. And we are a coalition of faith investors uh, and an advocacy uh, campaigning organization. And uh, we work very closely uh, with the, the uh, folks up, up front there. Um, I was interested to hear this comment about the savior, when is the savior coming, and uh, that discussion. But also Louise's point about actually, you know, it's up, to, it's up to us, I mean, there is something that we can do by engaging more with our investments and uh, understanding them, them more. But also Victoria's point about actually, I think a little bit about the black box, we've been slightly had the, the wool pull over our eyes as individuals, and particularly individuals as faith as well, um, about what we do with the money and where it goes and who uses it and are we thinking about uh, the issues of our faith and our finance. And I, which leads me very nicely to uh, a website that we're launching actually tomorrow which is called yourfaithyourfinance.org and it is there specifically to help uh, folks who have a, a Christian faith but also others uh, who may want some thinking about this and it, thinking about the usury side of things, someone was talking about that. There's a section on the website, I've got it written down here, it helps me, usury and the theology of money. And also, we have a section on the banking uh, side of things and the crisis and, and ways to think that through. So we feel that it's going to be filling a gap for people of faith to be able to develop their thinking about the money and what they use. So I would just say I fully agree with the speakers and uh, Simon, your particular sort of uh, analysis there as well is very helpful. Um, but we do need to take... Um, we need to use our faith and we need to take our responsibility uh, of, in the use of money more, perhaps uh, in an informed way. And I would really advocate that amongst us all here this evening. So it's more of an observation rather than a question. So my apologies for that, but uh, there we are. Um, 
My name is Peter West. I was involved with Just Share in the early days when I used to work here in London. I'm now retired and living 60 miles outside London, um, working really with people who um, feel very powerless um, beyond saying we've been conned all our lives. Um, one of my, well, my question is in a sense, I think historically, when the little people, let's use that phrase, have started to exercise their power, which they, I agree they have, if only they realize it, that often provokes uh, a reaction and, and a kickback that, that tries to suppress that. I mean, we saw that with the trades union movements in the 1970s and the 1980s. That's not to say that the trades unions always played their hand uh, tactically the best way they could. Um, do you see any signs of that happening with the kind of campaigning that, that you're trying to encourage people, the little people, to do? And uh, if you see signs of that happening, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the outcome of it? Um, so, great question, thanks. Um, I'm literally a little person, being just about five foot three, so um, I don't mean any offence by the phrase. Um, but uh, we haven't seen backlash yet. Um, partly a couple of reasons one the movement isn't you know we're not talking trade union movement levels yet so it's not a political force we should aim for it to be but it, it isn't just yet so we haven't seen some sort of concerted background backlash but secondly i think this is quite important there are a lot of people in the city who want to see people ask more questions um, we have a number of contacts in city firms who are very eager, like they'll, they'll ring us and say, well, are you doing it? Are you going to do anything about this? Or are you going to get people to start writing letters to pension funds about this? Because, you know, if, this, if there was more demand, then I'd be able to take steps inside. I'd be able to do something about this. I'd be able to get more budget, you know, and we'd be able to take more steps. So it isn't a monolithic enemy. For a start, I think that's very important. There are very progressive thinkers within the investment community who want to do this. You know, Iris is an example. Many of the clients of Iris are an example. So I think it's about showing, you know, in business terms, there's customer demand for this stuff. So if there's demand, there will be supply. Um, and then I think it's about um, building up the numbers. So, you know, it would be great to see signs of a backlash. I think we could overcome it. The trade union movement is strong and alive. And, you know, we could definitely come through it. Yeah, well, I'm six foot, so um, <laughs> not, 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 not perhaps little, literally. Um, I think that knowledge is power. I think I've made that clear. And um, the website that John Arnold mentioned, which I'm going to mention again because I'm on his board, is um, Your Faith, Your Finance, which is an excellent source of knowledge. We provide uh, free websites uh, for small charities, faith-based communities, and, and individuals as well, and we can give them knowledge on what they can do. Um, I do think that there's more knowledge out there in the public domain, but I, I think not to underestimate the amazing progress that the, the, uh, sorry, the faith-based community has made over the years. Um, I'm, I'm often asked, who is it that drives this kind of change? And, and from where I'm sitting, a lot of the change that has been driven by the faith-based community, including new areas of research and consciousness on the public radar, it would be the faith-based community that bring it up and drive it. And then it would go in turn to fund managers whose main motivation potentially is making money, potentially for the faith-based community, but it came from them, the demand came from them. So... To me, the faith-based community is incredibly powerful and um, one of the most amazing uh, pieces of progress that I've seen while I was at Iris was um, by JRCT, the Joseph Rantry Charitable Trust, who um, are a client of ours, but they found out one week that Reed Elsevier was invested in a military exhibition subsidiary, so they had a military record. They did everything they could to let everybody know that this was the case, and they actually got Reed Elsevier to divest from that military exhibition. And that kind of engagement from such a small organization, really, who is a faith-based organization, is absolutely phenomenal to me, which is just another example of what can be done if you have the knowledge that you need and you act appropriately. I just want to echo, I think, what both the speakers have said, so I'm a fund manager by background. Um, the number of evil people I have met in the city is very, very small. The vast majority are good people. They may be trapped in a flawed system, 
but we should certainly all view, view them all, I think, as potential recruits and people to work with. And the news that Louise has people ringing her up, you know, under the radar, trying to help, you know, this is, this is something we should welcome. Um, my view for UXIF and uh, ethical and sustainable investing is we want to draw the boundary just as wide as we credibly can so that it encompasses the faith groups, it encompasses the sympathetic people in the city, and it almost includes you know, the vast majority of the citizens in this country just because they don't like pollution. You know, let's form a very big alliance of the people who have got some of it, who get some of it, and let's not exclude people and, and you know, let's, let's all work together. Anyway, enough of my bit. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, perhaps enough for two more questions. This side of the room has been quiet. Is there anything coming from this side of the room at this stage? If not, I'll go back to the talkative side of the room. So, anybody, anybody else over there? Gentleman in red again. Yes, uh, it's my point on the monsters in the room, uh, macro level. Um, I don't really want to, uh, you know, some of these monsters might be benign to us and we just don't understand them fully. So for instance, the, the, the push for growth all the time, you, you, you read the newspapers, generally speaking, growth has fallen flat, growth has picked up last month. Um, it's very important. Um, to the people who are looking at things and the unemployment figures out today, uh, again, December the 18th and I think November the 12th, you know, key figures coming out now to compare us against America, these sort of things um, for, for the exchange rate, you know, for the currency people. Um, so I don't want to say, you know, they're bad things. I think there was, I, I vaguely remember something, something like Erkin's law of, there is a law that growth has to keep on going to employ enough people and if it falls off then you get huge unemployment um, and debt as I said you know in a way it's necessary to, it's not such a bad thing it does allow it may be at the expense of the next few generations it does allow growth to, to happen um, and unless you're Japan I mean, maybe the one of the best things we can do now is actually pull all our money out and buy things because um, we're not getting it in our cash ISA. So by buying things, you're either buying your own business and starting your own business or going into property or you're going into the equity market. Okay, I think that was again another observation, was it, rather than a question? Yes, okay. I think the gentleman at the rear for the last question then, Trish. I'll try to make it a question, but it's linked to an observation. You mentioned, I'll pick up what you said, maybe direct it to you. You're saying there's a lot of good people, no doubt. Uh, I hope there is. <laughs> uh, however, and, and to the panel, it's linked to what I said at the beginning. One is usury, I believe, is a crime. It's bad enough paying back capital borrowed. Compound interest drowns everyone, including rich countries. Look at America. You're, we're not addressing the monster, but this is linked to the cartel. Is the cartel, the private cartel, good people? Or a banking mafia. Now, I've raised a controversial issue. Unless you're prepared to put it on the table, you're going to get nowhere. I humbly submit from a global monetary reform perspective, there is videos on this, research on this, is that there is a banking cartel, for instance, that has taken over the US Fed, 1913. We can mention names, Rothschild, his agent Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, Jekyll Isle. It's, it's there, and then the private cartel. Unless we smash, if not smash, unless the public control is over public uh, finances, we're going to get nowhere. We're tinkering. And uh, unless people are conscious about the, the criminals, 
or the cartel um, and prepare to take them on. We need alternative ethical banking initiatives. Thank you. I don't think we've got time to discuss all of that. The, the, the bit I'll pull out of your observation is, I think, something about it's the people at the top who've been bad. I think I'd sign off on that. My optimistic take is that with the light of publicity and some of the trends which we've alluded to, they can be better controlled in the future. So I, I sit... Perhaps what we'll do is we'll have a vote. We'll hear from the panel, then we'll have the vote those who are in the optimist camp, those who are in the pessimist. I'm going to be in the optimist camp. Let's hear from the panelists, and then we'll put it to the floor and close. So, Just on that point that you raised. I yeah. think so. can, can it be better in the future because we can control, control the guys at the top? Um, yes. Um, what we need to do is, without sort of slandering anybody or calling anybody a criminal, the influence that powerful businesses, including the finance sector, exercise over government policy is unquestionable. Okay, we need to break that link. Part of breaking that link and that power game is, first of all, for civil society organizations to get in the game to, to an extent that they are often not. Often our organization is the only organization who provides a counterpoint on a particular government suggestion to industry. Um, you could ask your MP when they next come around canvassing, to what extent do they have regular meetings with senior business people versus meetings with regular people? So I agree with you that the power, the lobbying power of business is disproportional to the, the power of the people, and that needs to be addressed. I am optimistic, however, that because of all the terrible things that have happened, there is greater awareness among people that that needs to happen, and they're trying to do something about it with Occupy being a very real example of it. Yeah, I'm optimistic. Um, I wouldn't have been doing this for 10 years if I didn't think we were making any difference at all, or I'd just be a lunatic, I think, really. So it, it's dealing with everybody. It's, uh, <laughs> well, she says maybe I am. That's fair enough. That's a fair point. Um, to me, a lot of it's about um, accountability and regulation. Um, you see a lot about people being self-regulated by their own industry, and as well as the points that Louise raised, it would be good to see some powerful regulatory bodies actually enforcing common sense guidelines and rules on various sectors. Um, yeah, so that would be great to see. We have it in other areas in the world, but we're not so good at it here. Okay, so three optimists at the front. Let's put it to the vote on the, the body of the House as well. If it's... Okay, those who have hope then, perhaps please indicate raising your hand. Okay, Th those who have little hope, if I can put it like that. Well, that's actually unanimous. Everyone who voted, and I'm not sure everybody did, had some hope. So perhaps one abstention, the gentleman in, in white. It's just gone 7 o'clock. The marvellously tuneful bows have struck. We're due to finish at 7, so... Thank you very much indeed for attending. Uh, thank you, the rector, who I think has arrived, for hosting us. We're very grateful. There are some refreshments at the back. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>